Well, hello, I'm Mike Festiva. In this video, we're gonna be covering eight tips and tricks to make you a better welder and fabricator. This video is mainly focused towards people that are just starting out and getting used to welding and fabricating and wanna get better at that. If you've been welding and fabricating for the last 20 years or so, there's probably not gonna be much you're gonna take away from it because you learned all these already. But if you're newer to welding and fabricating, this video is gonna benefit you a lot. So stick around, and enjoy the video. So this first tip here, I think a lot of people miss the importance of. I know I did when I first started out welding years ago, how important it was to clamp your parts very well. Because metal has a tendency to warp and shift when you heat it and cool it. That if you actually spend a lot of time cutting and fitting all your parts to build something like a table, you get the legs all square and everything like that. And when you go to weld it, things, if you don't have it clamped right, it's going to shift out of square. And it's nothing more frustrating than having to cut apart your work and re-clamp it and recut it, fit it. And it's just one of those things that's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. So clamping your work well to either a welding table or even jigging it to some other type of box tubing or anything you can clamp something to to lock it down and keep it held really well before you start welding it will make a world of difference. There's a wide range of clamps available and different ways to do it, but clamping and holding your parts really well before you weld it is important. You don't want to just lay your parts loosely on a bench and start welding them unless you don't really care about it being square or not. So here's a little assortment of clamps here. These ones are really nice for clamping on the large stuff. You can really get a lot of clamping pressure with them. Depending on manufacture and make, these things tend to go from like 20 to about $60 a clamp. These sell from anywhere from 20 to $50. These have to be specially used on welding tables like this. This is a 5 8 rod. Basically you put it down, you clamp it on your part. And as this gets clamped tight, it locks it kind of in the, the hole here as a friction fit. If you don't have a welding table, those aren't gonna be very useful. These I use all the time. I probably have 10 of these around my shop. These you can get at Harbor Freight for two to $3 a clamp. You get different lengths. They're not the sturdiest and heaviest duty, but for the price, man, they're well worth having. At least get yourself four or six of them to have around the shop. Another thing you can do if you do have a fitment table like this, you can actually cut the end off of one of these clamps and modify it. So I just cut this end off here and you end up welding on some 5 eighths rod here and it drops down. I use this clamp all the time, super fast. These are nice, these little pad clamps like this. They're kind of helpful to have around, especially if you're doing like sheet metal work or something that you're repeating. I have like maybe six of these around the shop. I don't use C clamps there very often like this because they're slow to thread in and thread out, but they are useful to have around. So get yourself a few of those. If you're going to get a few, get some of these longer reach ones like this. These will set you back like three or four bucks a piece. If you're just starting out, get some of these at Harbor Freight, at least four to six of them and get a few of these just to have around. You can always expand later. So tip two, this one's gonna save you time and a lot of materials. Always consider tack welding all your parts first before you finish weld anything. It's nothing worse to get carried away, weld something on complete, and then realize you gotta cut it all off because you missed the step prior to that. It's one of those important things, especially helps to keep your parts from moving around too much. Like we talked earlier about clamping all your stuff well. Clamp it, figure out where you want everything, tack it really well, it holds it. But if you need to change anything, you can easily go back in and cut off a tack or two. I've got this welding bench here and got something set up for doing a repeated welds. Basically, I make a bunch of different 90 degree welds. So I've got all my cuts here, my stack, and basically I just clamp down a piece of straight tubing here and another one down the edge. I'm leaving this area open so I can put in my tacks right on the corners here and just makes perfect 90 degree tacks right here. Got my little workstation. Uh, also consider where you put your tacks. Don't put them in the inside corner on some angle iron where you can never get angle grinder in there to cut them. It's just uh, really just kind of think about what makes the most sense where you can get too easy, tack them. But if you need to remove them, you can grind them off with a little cut off wheel easily. And another thing that kind of helps for cosmetically for making your welds look nicer for your finished product is consider tacking on a start and stop point of your weld. So when you start there, you can start over that tack weld your whole seam and then you finish on a tack instead of having a tack in the center that you have to fill over and lumps your weld out larger more of a cosmetic thing than anything else but something to consider i'll show a quick little example where you'd want to tack some angle iron and where you wouldn't want to tack it so we'll get to that next so here's a simple little hypothetical joint that we're going to put together with some one and a half inch angle iron here where you would want to put tacks or something like out in this location and right here you would not want to put tacks in here or here because 
You can't really get the angle grinder down into those joints, but you can get to these joints. Just consider that when you're welding. Yeah, you don't want to tack in here and here because you can't really grind in there. You're going to have to break it off. So just put your tacks in the outside edges or if it's flipped over, you can still put tacks here, here, and here. And the other thing about that is if you put a tack here and you start welding up, you can weld all this and you end on another tack. Simple as that. So this tip is a simple one. You're going to probably make this mistake once or twice, but once you do it, you usually learn from that and you don't do it anymore. But that is heat builds up and will warp your parts. We talked about that a little bit with clamping. But if you actually have a long weld to make, don't make it continuous. Weld a section, move over a little bit. So if you're kind of newer to welding, uh, I could not stress enough to you how important it is to clamp your metal down to keep it from warping and not working over one area too much with heat. Try to move around a little bit to dissipate the heat, even let your parts cool off. Here I have a nice welding table I can actually put these clamps in, but if you didn't have something like this, some uh, C-clamps and some heavy duty angle iron across your two plates would actually be pretty adequate. Just uh, try not to put too much heat into your workpiece or you will definitely get some warping. Move around on the part. If you're making a bumper or something like that, move around and keep that heat dissipating throughout the whole part. If it's really hot, let it cool down for a while because nothing worse than welding something and find out something that's supposed to be flat is turned into a banana. And that will happen if you really just do major, long, hot, continuous welds. So you want to move around on your parts a little bit and just let that heat absorb into the metal and not get too hot because you will have some seriously warped parts. So don't make that mistake and learn from this one. All right, tip four. We've all heard this saying before, measure twice, cut once. This is pretty important. It's usually suggested and used in the construction and wood trade, you know, cutting lumber and stuff like that but it rings true for metal fabrication. So just when you're actually working on your parts and pieces, just make sure to measure everything out accurately and before you make any cuts. Nothing worse than to have a cut list and start cutting stuff and find that you made some sloppy mistakes in your measuring and your parts aren't actually accurately cut. Another thing, if you're cutting 90s, try to cut them accurate and true or 45s because it's really also one of those things you'll have a better looking part if you make sure that you don't have a bunch of gaps you're trying to fill and a stronger joint. So right here, just had the chop saw bolted down here earlier, clamped down, and I got this magnetic, 90 degree magnetic setup for a little fence. Adjustable fence for cutting multiple different lengths and uh, repeated cuts. I got all my cuts here, in my stack. That's when I'm gonna be welding all this stuff together, making these uh, finishing parts over here. Six down, three more to go. And if you're actually welding thicker metals, make sure to bevel the seams so you can get a deeper weld penetration and it leaves a much nicer weld profile. So just make sure that you make everything accurate and you measure twice, cut once. All right, before we get into tip five, I want to make a little suggestion. If you enjoy the video and you're not subscribed yet, please consider subscribing down below. On this channel, we have a whole bunch of DIY projects, welder reviews, and a bunch of cool builds. So consider subscribing, give it a thumbs up, and if you like the video, leave a comment down below. Tip five, plan your build before you start. It doesn't take very long to plan out your project. The simple sheet of paper and a pen, some measurements to figure out your lengths and your joints, how they all fit together. It only takes a few minutes to sketch this stuff out and you will actually have a lot better time building what you're actually trying to build because there's nothing worse than when you're actually planning in your head how you want to make something say a table and you end up welding the legs on the outside of your framework but originally you plan to have them underneath the framework because then you ended up with a wider table and a shorter table than originally planned so it comes down to planning out your stuff just with a simple piece of paper tape measure joints configuration lengths of everything you got your cut list done because if you can't draw it you're going to probably have a hard time building it all right, so tip number six. This is a pretty simple one, and you can always work to get better, and that is always try to improve your welds and your techniques. Whether that is just dialing in your machine a little better, trying to adjust the volts or wire speed a little bit more to achieve a nice looking weld. Also working with pushing or pulling your whip. Also weave patterns and different things like that. Every time you make a weld, try to make a mental note what you're doing and how your results turned out 
every weld you do that day, try to improve each one and take those mental notes you've already improved upon and build on that because if you keep working on trying to get better rather than just thinking, well, that's good enough, that weld's fine, you can always improve. And if you have a whole day of welding on something big, every weld you make, make it count. So that's one tip. I also want to talk about settings and machines right after this. So one thing I want to talk about is machines. This applies mainly to MIG machines and TIG machines, but we're going to focus mainly on MIG today. Not any two machine will ever really weld exactly the same, even if you set them up with the same volts and same wire speed, but with different makes and manufacturers, they're always going to weld different. You could have a Miller and another machine, another name brand machine even, and one's going to probably run hotter with those exact settings, and one's going to run a little cooler. Or but the thing is, it doesn't matter high end or low end, I've always found that you can still improve a machine's welding characteristics and the bead characteristics if you dial in your own machine to your own settings. Use the basic settings on the door or the auto set on the machine to get you get started, but those are just box stock settings to get you in the ballpark. Just because a machine, Miller or non-name brand, says these are the settings for it, you can always dial them in more. Usually they're just a general range. So don't feel concerned about, well, that's what that welder's manufacturer said this is for eighth inch or this is for quarter inch. Get in the ballpark with that, but I can guarantee you can probably dial in your machine just by practicing a little bit more and seeing what happens if you increase or decrease the volts a little bit or increase or decrease the wire a little bit. Play around with it because by doing that, you're going to have a much better understanding of what you can do with that machine and how to control it better. So tip number seven is prep is key. Clean your weld zone before you start welding, especially if you're TIG welding, but I have a whole how to TIG weld video I'll link below. That's a whole different beast. That's like extra clean. But if we're talking stick or MIG, especially MIG welding, just make sure that you clean on each side of your joint you're going to weld at least a half an inch. I like to use these uh, flat wheels on an angle grinder. Just clean away the rust and slag or paint anywhere in that area. And uh, you'll really cut down porosity and just get a much nicer looking weld and a stronger weld. Another side note for safety, try not to ever weld galvanized metal. It puts off some pretty gnarly toxic fumes. So do your research if you're even gonna tackle something like that. I just avoid it altogether if I can. Another thing is never ever clean your parts with brake clean. At least brake cleans that were used in the past, they had some really gnarly chemicals that if you heated them up, if it was still damp on there, it's like straight up poison. So just keep that in mind. So the final tip, tip number eight, one of those things that I think we can apply this not only for metal fabrication and welding, but for most skills and hobbies you learn as you get older. Anything that's new to you, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Everything you're gonna do, you're gonna make mistakes in the beginning. Don't be uptight and tense about it. Just try to have fun, relax, and enjoy the learning process. And learn from your mistakes, because you will get better. The more time you spend doing something you enjoy doing, the better you'll get at it. So I got a few final notes to wrap up this video and uh, we'll finish it up. Well, before we wrap this video up, I wanna kinda of give a little background on me and my metal fabrication background. So when I was about 15 years old was probably the first time I actually ever used a welder. My stepdad showed me how to basically weld this old AC buzz box and gave me some tips and let me start doing my metal work and kinda of helped me along the way cutting parts and pieces, but I ended up making a little tractor implement blade for my garden tractor I had at the time and it held up great but uh, you know it was kind of weird running those AC buzz box and sticking the rod and that was when I was about 15 I'm 41 now and probably over the last 10 to 12 years have I really been more interested in welding I've always had welders here and there when I could afford them but now it's like one of those things I have more welders than I even need I have AC DC TIG machines I got spool guns MIG and stick machines uh, it's one of those things I do a lot of fabrication on this channel. I started this channel about seven years ago. I built a quad truck, sawmill, log arch, articulating dump truck, uh, working on mini pins gower, and a lot of other videos in between. A lot of reviews and tips and tutorials and videos on how to help people get started with like flux welding with just a simple flux welder if it's your first welder. Have other videos on how to TIG weld because when I taught myself how to TIG weld about four years ago, uh, most of the videos I could find and information was always lacking some parts of it, crucial parts. 
So I decided to sit down and write out a whole script of everything I wanted to cover and fit it in about a 20 minute video so you can study that video and learn from it and rewatch it a few times and then go out to your shop and practice, practice, practice. I want to cover all the things that I felt like most of the other how to videos were lacking. So if you're new to my channel, this kind of gives you a background. Uh, for the last 13 years, I've been a millwright. I do a lot of welding and fabrication, also wrenching on machines. So if something breaks, I'm back there diagnosing CNC equipment, fixing brackets that may have broke. I do welding almost every single day at my day job. And on the weekends when I get time, I'm working on YouTube videos and working on projects out in my shop here. So we have a little saying on this channel, encourage, don't discourage. So if you know somebody that's learning how to weld or wanting to learn something and you know the skill very well, don't talk down to them, encourage them, give them some helpful tips, but just be encouraging. All right, take care. Bye.